Good evening and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and master gardener in training, Tanisha Shade Spain. We are looking forward to a wonderful show tonight. Can't wait to hear from you later on in the broadcast. But first, we've got some great show and tells to get to tonight. So first, we're gonna have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about them. And then we'll get started on some of those questions that you've got. So we'll start with you, Kelly. Thank you very much, Tanisha. It's very nice meeting you for Same the first you. time. Um, my show and tell is a really cool insect that's buzzing around right now, and it is called a hoover fly. A lot of people actually think it is a sweat bee because it comes up and it drinks your sweat. And this is its peak season, but they are amazing, amazing pollinators. And what you see on camera right now is the larva of a hoover fly. And this is a great big aphid eating maggot. So the larva of a hoover fly eats aphids and the adult eats pollen and nectar. And this is a great beneficial insect to have. Every single time I go up to an infestation of aphids, which a lot of you should have aphids all over your milkweeds right now, you probably turn over leaf and actually see one of these guys. So this is a really awesome guy to have in the garden. Whether you know it or not. Whether, <laughs> yeah. Most people would never even know he's there, but he is there and he is eating those aphids up. All right, all right. Kay, uh, tell us what you brought. Well, I brought some of my heirloom tomatoes as probably a lot of longtime listeners know. I'm a real heirloom fan. And I just brought a few to show um, colors and, and textures and um, this this tomato is actually a green tomato. The flesh is green. I'm just going to cut into it just a little bit. Um, it's not qu <clears throat> quite as ripe as it should be, but that's what it'll be look like, like when it's ripe. Mm -hmm. And um, they're very good. They have a little bit of a, not a tangy flavor, but um, they're sweet, but they're, uh, they can be a little tart. Um, this is uh, called... Um, Amish paste tomato, and it's one of my very favorites. Um, it's really great for canning, mm -hmm. but it it's a it eats. It's really good for eating too. We had them for bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. <laughs> that this sounds year. delicious. <laughs> um, it's a very <laughs> solid tomato. It has very small uh, seed cavities in it, and so that's what makes it um, really good for canning. This is an orange tomato. It's called Dad's Sunset and um, it's not yellow, it's actually orange, mm -hmm. and it's a very pretty tomato. It's also um, very good. And finally, I have, this was a new one for me this year. This is, really isn't an heirloom, um, but it is a really fun, it is an open pollinated, but it's a really fun tomato. It's called Brad's Atomic Grape. <laughs> Nice. And it gets, it starts out green with this kind of black shoulder on it, and then it gets these red streaks and the black kind of turns to a brown. And I'm gonna cut it open so you can see what it looks like. Really unique maybe. coloring on that one. It is, and inside it's red and green. Mm -hmm. And it is the sweetest tomato I have ever eaten in my life. It tastes like a sugar tomato flavored sugar cube. Oh, wow. Um, so it's really been a fun tomato. This is one I'll probably start growing every year. Interesting. So those, just a few. I think it's funny how you get so many different flavor differences mm -hmm. and the different varieties, you know, for people who just think a tomato is a tomato or maybe not like tomatoes, you mm -hmm. could do so much mm -hmm. that you don't know, you know, getting yeah. different flavors. And they are all different. It's, yeah. it, it's really fun. Um, and they make gorgeous salads when you yes. uh, just cut them, slice them with some mozzarella cheese. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. And Jim, what did you bring for okay, us today? Well, First of all, I'm a retired uh, plant pathologist at the University of Illinois, and I brought carpenter bees. These are the big guys, and this is the little guy, and they are two different species. And this is a honeybee, so I brought it in so you can compare the size of a little carpenter bee to the honeybee versus the big carpenter bees. And this is a damage that the carpenter bee has done. Uh, you can see how big the holes are and they get really close to the edge of the wood. And you may be able to see inside, like this one uh, over here, the uh, exit hole 
because what they do, the female uh, does the drilling, and it may be up to three feet long. She lays an egg, goes find food, packs that against the egg, then walls it off, and she keeps doing that until she has filled the entire tunnel. Now, uh, and then she drops dead. The <laughs> eggs and she that does go, all the work and then yeah, drops dead. Right. <laughs> and, and they go through the winter, and then the next year they mature and start coming out, and that's how you got that one little hole here. Or they're known to drill right through the wood and come out the side because you, they don't want to drill past other eggs or live insects, so they, a lot of them will come out right from the side where they were. Uh, they're very destructive, and they often pick on wood that is uh, basically unfinished. That's the kind, no paint, no shellac, mm -hmm. polyurethane. Now, if you have carbon rance and you have painted it, that probably indicates that your paint has gotten too old or your shellac or polyurethane has gotten too old because after so long, it no longer acts as a retardant for them drilling in the wood. Mm -hmm. So about every three years, you ought to reseal paint your uh, wood. And the wood, I'd say 95% of all the calls I ever got on these carpenter bees were in decks or the over, wood used overhead to shade it. Uh, I mean, because a lot of people said, I want it to look natural, so they didn't treat the wood. And that just made a perfect Big home mistake. for them. Yes. Wow. So when you see those, it's probably too late. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you've already seen the hole, then you want to catch them. If you've seen the hole, yes, they're starting, mm -hmm. you can put some carbaryl in there, seven, and that'll kill the female. But if you've already made the long tunnel, the damage has already been done mm -hmm. to the wood. And they can be so close together uh, in tunnel that the uh, space in between the hole is as thin as a tissue paper. Oh, wow. And um, one other thing, I, was, I just forgot what I was going to say about <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, the, uh, um, I just went and you lost it again. I go out again. <laughs> that's, that's what you get for being old. <laughs> well, you think about it. Oh, Jim, some of us are actually putting that untreated wood around our landscape because we actually want the carpenter bees and we want the pollinators. So ah. okay. we're like building these little hotels and uh, they're Inviting starting to them. drill in. Yeah. They, they, they'll drill in the uh, leftover stumps and so. Well, they give you something other than yeah. your deck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Distractive. All right. <laughs> Looks like we've got some calls on the line. Let's start with uh, call line three, Kathy in Champaign. She has a question about spider wart. Kathy, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Hi. what's your question? Um, my question is, what do I do with spider wart and flax um, after they've bloomed and they're starting to look really crummy? Do I have to leave them? Do they seed or do they grow from underneath? What do I do? When can I cut them? Well, spider wart doesn't... Um, I don't think it's seeds, I'm not sure, but um, that that doesn't spread really rapidly. Uh, Phlox doesn't spread very much at all either, so if you if it's a size you are happy with and um, like it, I would just leave it. You could probably deadhead the phlox. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she's not liking wood. the look of it, so can she cut it back at this point? Well, I wouldn't cut either either one of them back. Okay, um, they're both perennials, and um, I wouldn't cut them back. But I, you, you could deadhead them okay. and cut the old, dirt, you know, flowers off. Uh, out of curiosity, are the flocks looking bad because they got a powdery mildew on them and killing the leaves? They've had yes, they've had some issues with their leaves looking kind of. Mildewy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. You, you in, in the spring and early summer, you may want to use a fungicide to keep that down. That'll make your flocks look better longer mm -hmm. into the season. Okay. And, and two, that goes to another point: is um, all the new, improved flocks that we have these days. This could, you could still be growing an older one, 
and maybe you want to replace that phlox with some new cultivar that actually has more resistance to that powdery mildew and won't flop over and look quite as bad at the end of the season. And I know people don't like replacing plants, but that's what we us horticulturists do. <laughs> we put in a plant, it looks bad, and we're like, uh, I think I'm gonna replace this with something <laughs> different. And we go get a much better, newer, improved cultivar. There's some great flocks out there like Glamour Girl that has a powdery mildew resistance and looks great in the fall too. Okay. So that might be another option. So she's got a couple of op yeah. options. Mm -hmm. Treat it early or replace it with something new. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to four now. Betsy in normal. Question about a gourd plant. Betsy, are you there? I am. Hi, what's your question? Um, in the spring, I planted three or four gourd seeds and three of the plants came up and they climbed the arbor just fine and I started watching the flowers turn into gourds and I had at one time about 10 possible gourds. Well, now two of them are about four inches long and the others are just turning brown and dropping off. And I just wonder, am I overwatering or underwatering? Any ideas on that? Where is it growing in the landscape? Yeah. Is it in a pot in the... No, it's, it's in, the, in the soil. In the soil. And is it full That's sun? What I was told to do. Do you have it in full sun? Um, it's partial sun. Yeah. Oh. Um, huh, that uh, might how be much it. have you been watering it? Has it been getting a lot of rain or not much? It's, I mean, well, it, rain's been so spotty this year. Right. <laughs> we live in normal, so we've gotten not much rain. Not much. And when I water our other plants and garden around it, it, it gets water. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I've overwatered it. Yeah. A gourd is a cucurbit. There's been some issues this year with poor pollination, which is why we actually want the carpenter bees. So I know that there has been some issues with cucurbits this year with poor pollination. That could be it. But I really suspect that it is the part sun that you're growing it in because they require absolute full sun. And you're not going to get the best flowering, the best fruiting if you don't have full sun. Now that you said that, I have one growing out of my compost in almost complete shade, and it's got three gourds on it, and they're huge. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's in always the exceptions to the rule. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it could be variety too. You know, You're right. True. Yep. Yep. True. But yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. We're going to go to Logan in Springfield. He has a question about iris care. Logan, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. I've heard that I should trim my iris back to about six inch fans about this time of year. Supposedly it prevents boring or borer attacks. Uh, is that true? And is there anything else I should be doing uh, to take care of my iris? I'm going to answer that question for you. <laughs> well, that's a good perennial question for yeah. her. I know she knows the answer. Well, I, I have a lot of irises, and I, I rarely trim them back that far. I get some of them trimmed, and the rest get lost in the shuffle. <laughs> um, and they seem to do, do okay, and I don't really have um, borer problems. So um, they do look nicer if you trim them back. Um, I do get in and try to pull out dead leaves mm -hmm. and clean them out a little bit, you know, try to pull out any dead tubers and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but it's, I don't know that it's absolutely necessary to cut them back. But if he, the, if he, it, it, if he doesn't have them, then mm -hmm. it's not necessary to right. cut them back. But if he does has, have them, then it is necessary mm -hmm. to cut them back because the larva is in the, mm -hmm. In, in the, the leaf. So yeah. I guess do you, if, you have, if you don't have them, then you don't have to cut them back. <laughs> okay. Do you have them? Uh, no, I haven't noticed any. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think with perennials, um, you know, most of the time we're like not cutting them back these yeah. days. Mm -hmm. And we only cut back if we have like powdery mildew mm -hmm. or yeah. insect or, issues. Well, and he would know also if he had iris born because they leave a brown streak as they go down through the leaves mm -hmm. into the rhizome. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a brown streak, now there also is a bacterial disease that'll do it too, but the brown streak is oftentimes in the earlier summer uh, near the iris born. So if you don't have any of them, you know you don't have the born. Okay. All right. Solid advice. Okay. We're going to go to line six now. Stephen and Muhammad with a question about cucumbers for pickles. Stephen, are you there? 
Uh, yes. Go Thanks ahead. To my call, and uh, my question is that uh, we've been we had some pickles. Uh, we uh, they kind of been running across the grass and all that sort of stuff, and we we're looking for some that is good ones to climb on a trellis. And uh, some of our cucumbers, we were doing a seven days calded uh, recipe. You know where you put the blood and water on them, stuff like that, to make our sweet pickles. And some of them turned out hollow. So I th what we're looking for is a good variety of pickles to climb on a trellis that have small seeds, you know, and, and they'll end up having the, the, the solid slices when we're done, if we could. Well, I grew, this year I grew one called Muncher, and it did extremely well. Um, it's a fairly good-sized cucumber, but I did have it on a trellis, um, and it it did pretty well. The seed size is due to when you pick it. So if you pick them when they just start filling out mm -hmm. and don't let them get really huge, then you're you're always going to have a seed cavity in it. But it'll be much smaller, and the seeds will be a lot smaller. So. Um, you know, regardless of what variety you grow, um, you want to pick them uh, as early as you can. You can tell when they kind of fill out. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my recommendation. There's a lot of good uh, pickling varieties, uh, but I was really pleased with the muncher. Okay, all right. Let's go to uh, Jean in Athens with a question about zucchini fruit. Jean, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Thank go you. ahead. We're having trouble uh, with our vining plants this year. We do rotate our crops. We have watered and fertilized more this year than ever. We have not had one zucchini. The cucumbers are very small, as are the acorn squash and the butternut squash. Mm. I'm talking about three inches long on, no. on acorn and butternut, and maybe three, four-inch cucumbers. Need some help. <laughs> so you say you have fertilized? Yes. When and what did you use? I started out when we planted with um, like 10, 10, 10 or 12, 12, 12, whatever. Uh, then in during the growing season, at least twice we've used a, a miracle Grow product mm. designed for vegetables. You may be over yeah. fertilizing it. Um, uh, it sounds it sounds like you're yeah. uh, fertilizing a little bit too much. The Miracle Grow is a very potent mm -hmm. um, fertilizer, mm -hmm. and so um, I would recommend um, you know maybe fertilizing initially. And since you haven't had any rain, the fertilizer hasn't been washed out of the soil. Um, so I I think you're just over fertilizing them. Yeah, you're. you're um, rabbit grow are is high in nitrogen. That says grow leaves and forget the flowers. So, that, like you say, is, is the main problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other than what she's seeing, are there any other visible um, symptoms, if you will, of over fertilizing that she can maybe look for? Mm -hmm. well, you know, get a lot of vines and leaves. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I think we over fertilize our vegetables as a society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, they really just need one or two fertilizing. Tomatoes might be a little bit more, but we just, we, we, we over fertilize mm -hmm. thinking that a little bit of fertilizer is good. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the books, you know, usually it's like tomatoes, you fertilize, you know, uh, two or three weeks after planting. And then when you see the small fruits and then maybe in, again, three weeks later, mm -hmm. w w how do you fertilize your squash? I well, I, I haven't grown squash for, I don't fertilize squash, to be honest with you. Um, and my tomatoes, I, when I plant them, I put a handful of compost in, mm -hmm. in the hole, uh, along with, um, uh, this year I used crushed up eggshells mm -hmm. for the calcium. And um, I, I can mix in my own fertilizer of uh, blood meal, bone meal, and usually some potash. And I'll sprinkle maybe a, a tablespoon mm -hmm. of that in there, and that's it. I don't fertilize after that. Where I used to live, mm -hmm. I had a, a lot of uh, oaks across the street, and they would blow in my yard. 
I grind them up and work them into the garden mm. in the fall, oh. and then they're rotten by spring, and that's the only thing they ever got from the nutrients, were the dead leaves that had composted mm. through the winter. I never added any other yeah. fertilizer. I use cl grass clippings for mm -hmm. mulch, that's a good and one too. Um, that's fantastic because that fertilizes, you mm -hmm. know, and you dig it in, and it's, it's a really excellent mm -hmm. mulch. But I want her to get a soil test. I was thinking mm -hmm. that. I yeah. want you to go to your local extension office or mm -hmm. email somebody or call somebody. Find a, a facility that tests your soil. You know, the facility we use in my area is only $25. They tell you exactly what is, wh what's in mm -hmm. your soil, the pH, the different mm -hmm. components. They tell you exactly what to do. You tell them what crops you're growing. And then maybe it might be a soil test. Mm -hmm. Usually yeah. that's one of my biggest things is when somebody's having problems with a plant, the first thing I say is sun, and the second thing I say is soil. Mm -hmm. So it could be soil, because she's mm -hmm. probably, you know, has really great soil. She's built it up, so she's not gonna have the same problems that the rest of mm -hmm. us are gonna have. <laughs> <laughs> Overachiever, right? <laughs> okay. All right, line four, Ellen in Urbana with parsley worms. Ellen, go ahead. Hi, I have a flat, a flat leaf parsley plant. Uh, been doing great, but earlier this week I was looking at it and some of the leaves were gone and I realized then that there were 10 or more of these worms or caterpillars or something on it um, of all sizes, little babies and then a couple real big ones. They were light yellow green with some black and yellow markings on them and when I looked right at them I could see their mouths just crunching away on the leaves and within a couple days all the leaves were off this parsley plant and most of the larger sized worms are gone now but there's a few babies left but they never seem to have moved on to any of the other plants so I'm wondering I've never had that happen any other year I, I've grown parsley every year can you tell me what it is well, well, you didn't even have to describe it. We <laughs> they were nodding the entire time. As soon as you time. said parsley worms, we knew exactly <laughs> what it was. You are raising black swallowtail caterpillars. So congratulations. <laughs> You're helping the butterfly population. Uh, when people, when they eat the parsley, I always say, just go get another parsley plant and plant some more for yourself because, <laughs> um, you know, they want food too. If you poke them, they'll actually send out a yellow forked gland that'll try to get you to go away. I love doing that with kids. Um, but, um, you know, I get really, really excited when I see the parsley worms or black swallowtail mm -hmm. caterpillars. Mm -hmm. What about you, Kay? Yeah, I didn't have any this year, but I have had them in the past, um, and I do have them on some other things. So, but um, yeah, they, I love them because I know that you know it's beneficial for. You know the old saying: you plant one for God, one for nature, yes. and one for yourself. <laughs> yes. You didn't there plant you enough. <laughs> so count that one out, right? Actually, you know, parsley is my least favorite herb, oh, so I they can it. eat it if they want. They can have that one. Okay. I, I love really parsley. quick, want to let you know you can uh, join Mid American Gardener experts this Saturday, August 18th, for a two-hour roadshow style event at the Urbana Market at the Square. Panelists so far include Master Gardener Kay Carnes here with us today <laughs> and horticulture expert Kelly I can't see the name <laughs> of that next person it's but just me. make sure you're there <laughs> oh Kelly Kelly <laughs> right here on stage uh, so make sure you stop in for that on Saturday again Saturday the 18th for a two-hour roadshow event at the farmers market uh, rusty molding will be mm -hmm. your last one bring your plants photos videos or anything that's going on in your garden that you could use some help with all right, we're going to go to line six. We have a question. Hi, what can we help you with? Hi, my name is Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, I have a question about bagworms. Okay, shoot. We have about 10 fir trees, different varieties. We have a 10-foot blue spruce, and within the last two weeks, we have picked off over 100 bagworms. And the tree, tree looks fine. It's not damaged anywhere. So every day I'm out there, and I find at least four to five every day, um, how, why is it they produce so quickly and <laughs> when will they stop? Um, I'm Who's going to break it to her? No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I feel bad. It's like these, uh, 
bagworms, uh, they, the, the best time to spray for bagworms, we've missed that window, is the first week of July and you would do a BT or call your extension office and let them um, tell you what to spray. But um, what they've done is they have, they have hatched from those bags, crawled to the tops of the trees. They put out a little piece of silk and they carry to other trees and you just have a lot on your trees. What you're doing is exactly what I would do is keep picking off the bagworms. It's the best thing you can do. Don't just throw them on the ground, but get rid of them because they'll still emerge if you just throw them on the ground. Um, Jim, you want to add anything to no, bagworms? Okay. Yeah, you're all covered. How long will she be picking these bagworms? She can pick all fall long. <laughs> See? Look at that. <laughs> pick what a all fun activity. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes the evergreens are so big that it is hard to pick all those bags off. So if she wants to help herself out a, a little bit next year, she needs to do a spray in early July and contact her extension office to what she should spray. All right, wonderful. Well, we are out of time for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to our lovely panelists who are here with us tonight. And make sure you stop out at the Urbana Market at the Square this Saturday. Uh, for our road show. Bring any questions you've got, any plants that you need identified or questions you have. And don't forget about our podcast. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, all over the web. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.